Our presenter is Dr. Marion Gardner. She's uh, one of our first year fellows here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, Marion completed her medical school at the University of Tennessee before going to Indiana University for internal medicine residency. And now she's here with us at VUMC. Today, she's going to be talking to us about fungal peritonitis. And we're also delighted to have Dr. Nadeau Fredette with us today, one of the co-authors uh, of the paper that we're discussing today. Marin, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll start by um, just kind of saying a little bit about why I wanted to look into this topic. Um, my, uh, on our inpatient rotation, we had a patient who came in with recurrent fungal peritonitis. So I, I just wanted to learn a little bit more about, um, you know, what our understanding was of risk factors for fungal peritonitis. Um, and then I thought it was a good opportunity, especially for the fellows here, just to kind of do a little bit of a dive into the topic in general. So um, it may be uh, some review for the seasoned nephrologists in the audience, but um, hopefully some good Good things to review for all of us. Um, so we'll dive in. Oh. Um, I have no disclosures, and this is just kind of an outline of um, what we'll be talking about. So, first, reviewing the relevance of fungal peritonitis um, and the reasons that we should be. Um, kind of tuned into risk factors and prevention. Um, the symptoms and presentation, diagnosis, risk factors, treatment and prevention, um, and then kind of uh, uh, delve into um, our paper today and then kind of talk a little bit about some takeaways. Um, so, oops, sorry. Let me fix my screen here so I can see all my notes. So um, first is uh, just to review kind of the relevance of fungal peritonitis. So um, fungal peritonitis accounts for between uh, five and 15% of peritonitis episodes. Um, and uh, I think it's relevant to keep in mind that one of the mainstays of treatment is um, urgent catheter removal. Um, so I think that along with some of the complications of peritonite, of the fungal peritonitis um, do lead to increased risk for technique failure for um, peritoneal dialysis in general. Um, failure to resume uh, peritoneal dialysis occurs in up to 40% of patients with fungal peritonitis episodes. Um, and it's also reported to contribute to pretty prolonged hospital stays. Um, uh, looking at, you know, studies, um, what do I say, aggregated information of various studies of fungal peritonitis, um, I saw ranges anywhere from 18 to 30 days um, uh, reported in terms of length of stay in the hospital. And then uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, fungal peritonitis is uh, associated with increased mortality than other, um, other peritonitis cases. So reported range from three to, to a half of cases um, compared to two and a half to 9% um, of uh, other etiologies of peritonitis in patients who are on um, peritoneal dialysis. So how do these patients present? Um, well, not surprisingly, they present the same way as our patients who have bacterial peritonitis. Um, so uh, primary presenti presenting symptoms include cloudy effluent, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, um, poor ultrafiltration, fever, and abdominal pain. Um, notably, there's a uh, one study I looked at out of Hong Kong that showed that 100% of their cases um, were patients reported cloudy effluent, 68% um, reported abdominal pain, um, and then 36% had fever. 21% um, uh, presented with bowel obstruction. Um, and then in terms of clinical findings, um, abdominal tenderness is reported in 70% of patients, rebound tenderness in 50%, and then even um, bloody effluent in 20%. 
Um, for a turn of the dialysate during episodes of fungal peritonitis um, seems to occur more frequently uh, with infections caused by mold, um, which can potentially block drainage from the catheter ports. Um, in terms of known risk factors, um, so some, some reported risk factors based on uh, retrospective studies include um, previous episodes of peritonitis or frequent peritonitis, recent antibiotic therapy, um, immunosuppression, and malnutrition as uh, cor uh, correlated with the patient's serum albumin. Um, so the thought processes um, as to why peritonitis or antibiotic use may increase the risk um, for these infections um, is that potentially the inflammation of the peritoneum may enhance susceptibility to fungal invasion. And then antibiotic use um, used to treat peritonitis may kill off normal skin and bowel flora, kind of giving a window of opportunity for fungal overgrowth that can um, increase risk of contamination um, during catheter manipulation. Um, multiple studies have shown an association uh, with antibiotic use, particularly within kind of the three month window before an episode of fungal peritonitis. And then looking into um, immunosuppression as a risk factor. Um, there is one study that's a bit older out of, um, uh, that showed that, that patients who have HIV infection do have high, were reported to have higher rates of peritonitis. So um, 3.9 episodes um, for outpatient uh, peritoneal dialysis year compared to non-HIV infected patients with a reported rate of 1.5 episodes for peritoneal dialysis year <clears throat> with particularly increased risk for pseudomonal um, infection. Um, although this was, was an older study um, from the late 80s to the early 90s, so undoubtedly um, treatment for HIV has uh, come a significant distance from that standpoint. In terms of kind of the um, antibiotic use as a risk factor, again, this is one association that's kind of pretty um, pretty consistently seen in multiple studies. Um, a more recent study out of China um, comparing episode, compared episodes of bacterial and fungal peritonitis um, in their uh, patients and showed that episodes of fungal peritonitis um, were associated with greater usage of antibiotics one month before the onset of the peritonitis episode. Um, and then of note, uh, just, whoop, sorry. Um, that, that study, uh, in that study, um, they were not using fungal prophylaxis. So I think that's also important to know, um, but, uh, but there was increased risk of fungal peritonitis with, um, with antibiotic use based on their results. Um, in terms of looking at factors that are, have been associated with technique failure, um, after an episode of fungal peritonitis, there are often um, low rates of patients who are able to resume uh, peritoneal dialysis, as we uh, or I kind of alluded to in the beginning. Um, and some of the factors noted to contribute to the technique uh, or the risk of technique failure include complications of infection, such as um, peritoneal adhesions, abscess formation, or um, development of progressive sclerosing peritonitis. Um, and this table is from a study out of China with, uh, that reviewed 70 cases of fungal peritonitis over a nine-year period um, in a single center. So they looked at cases from January 2011 through December 2020. And they co compared the fungal peritonitis cases to those um, of patients diagnosed with bacterial peritonitis in a one to six matching uh, or one to six ratio matching for the case control study. Um, and their results suggested that abdominal pain was associated with higher rates of technique failure than those with ab abdominal pain. So 71% versus 24%. And they also found an association of uh, bowel obstruction with technique failure. So 93% versus 50%. 
Um, in addition, patients with previous antibiotic use in the preceding three months showed significantly higher technique failure compared with those without antibiotic use. So 65% versus 27%. Um, so uh, kind of looking at specific risk factors associated with increased mortality, as we talked about earlier, um, fungal peritonitis has been associated with higher mortality rates than bacterial peritonitis. Um, so what, what specific risk factors have been shown to be associated with increased mortality? Um, so a retrospective study of uh, 94 cases um, at a single center in China suggested a correlation with delayed catheter removal. Um, in addition, the presence of intestinal obstruction and higher white blood cell counts, both in the blood and the PD effluent, were also independently associated with mortality. Um, notably, there's kind of some differing reports, but um, uh, from what I was able to find mortality rates don't differ between Canada and non-Canada species. Um, and then among Canada species, not differing between albicans and non-Canada uh, albicans. Um, but there is um, but infection with Canada paracelosis um, was shown to be an independent risk factor for mortality. So that one kind of showing a higher um, Risk, higher risk of mortality. Um, in terms of how, so how we diagnose um, fungal peritonitis is um, the same as kind of our diagnosis for bacterial peritonitis. So from the ISPD guidelines, two out of the three um, following criteria. So the first is clinical features of peritonitis. Um, and then the other two are uh, dialysis effluent white count of greater than 100 micro microliters um, uh, with after a dwell time of at least two hours with greater than 50% neutrophils um, or a positive dialysis effluent culture. Um, and then this table is a review article uh, from a review article um, by Prasad and Gupta and Peritoneal Dialysis International on fungal peritonitis in PD patients, um, including what type of fungal isolates were reported. Um, so there, these studies are in different areas of the world, um, but there are some patterns that we can see um, and notably seeing that Canada is the most common um, kind of uh, etiology here across the board. You can see um, upwards 70% for most of these studies. Um, and then there's some, some older studies that show predominantly Canada albicans, maybe some newer studies showing non-albican species becoming more prominent. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of treatment, um, this is a table from the ISPD guidelines. Um, so upon diagnosis of fungal peritonitis, the, the first step is, uh, or one of the first things that we should be thinking about is trying to remove that PD catheter um, promptly. Um, the recommendation comes from studies reporting mortality um, rates up to 50 to 91% among patients who did not have their catheter removed as part of their treatment. Um, and the fatality rate is about two to three times that of patients who are treated with catheter removal. Um, catheter removal has been associated also, interestingly, with a better chance of resuming per uh, peritoneal dialysis. Um, in terms of uh, treatment duration, it depends on kind of the uh, type of uh, fungus uh, identified. Um, so the guidelines recommend therapy for a minimum of two weeks um, and um, sometimes up to four weeks. Um, irrespective of treatment duration, catheter uh, reinsertion and resumption of dialysis should um, have been reported after a median period of about 15 weeks um, in less than a third of cases. So looking at our, um, our kind of uh, tree here, 
if yeast or hyphae are found on gram stain, then you can go ahead and start empiric therapy with uh, fluconazole. Um, if patients have been previously exposed to azoles, um, recommendations are for amphotericin B or an IV echinocandin. Um, and in general, candida albicans, candida paracelosis, and candida tropicalis are susceptible to azoles um, and can be treated for two to four weeks. Um, candida crucii and candida glabrata uh, tend to have resistance. Um, but susceptibility patterns can be variable. So if you do isolate either of those um, treatment with an echinocandin or boriconazole is um, recommended while you're waiting for susceptibilities, um, as well as longer treatment durations of four weeks rather than the two weeks. And then if the um, fluid cultures uh, yield a mold, um, then initial treatment is recommended uh, with amphotericin until you get speciation. Um, and then if it's aspergillus, can consider oral boriconazole, um, mucomycete um, can treat with um, posaconazole or amphotericin B. Um, in terms of prevention, the ISPD guidelines recommend um, whenever patients who are on peritoneal dialysis are on prolonged course of antibiotics, regardless of indication um, that they be placed on fungal prophylaxis, um, and that can come in the form of a uh, nice statin or um, oral fluconazole. So that all that is kind of background to bring us to our paper. Um, so this is a study um, characteristics and outcomes of fungal peritonitis in a modern North American cohort. Um, and I, I'm excited to hear that one of uh, the authors is um, in, in our call today. Um, so first published in Peritoneal Dialysis International um, in January 2015. Um, so the study is a retrospective cohort study, including all fungal peritonitis episodes and patients who were treated um, with peritoneal dialysis at University Health Network between January 2000 and February 20, uh, 2013. Um, and I Googled and it looks like that was in Toronto, but that may not, out of Canada. Um, and they evaluated uh, rates of, of fungal peritonitis, um, relevant outcomes, patient characteristics, um, and determinants of death. They um, identified a total of 36 episodes of fungal peritonitis. Um, and then events were retrieved using their mon monthly peritonitis reports, which collected baseline information um, about all peritonitis events within the program. And then the patient's individual demographics, comorbidities, antibiotic exposure um, were collected using electronic medical records. Um, and they used a Charleston comorbidity index to um, combine individual comorbidities um, in assessing those risks. Um, the definitions that they used um, in terms of defining fungal peritonitis, um, transfer to di hemodialysis, and um, death uh, secondary to fungal peritonitis are kind of here. And then um, just looking at baseline characteristics for their um, patients reviewed. So the average age was 61. 42% um, male and 42% Caucasian. Um, and then below are relevant uh, comorbidities. So significant proportion of patients with diabetes and 41%, hypertension and 83%, coronary disease and 58%, and peripheral arterial disease and 31. Um, and looking at their uh, etiology of their kidney disease, so um, just in my it kind of correlating with those comorbidities, 42% uh, had diabetic kidney disease, uh, 22 hypertensive, 25% um, had glomerular, glomerular disease or vasculitis, and peripertinemia, and 8%. Um, and then uh, in terms of how did these patients present, so we kind of talked a little bit about um, this in our review before delving into the paper, but 
Um, common presenting symptoms included cloudy dialysate, which as, the, as we talked about earlier, was present in 100% of patients. Um, abdominal pain, which was present in 81%, and then less a little less commonly fever in 19%. Um, in terms of how the what what fungi were isolated um, in culture when um, these patients were diagnosed, um, this the paper identified kind of similar um, similar patterns to what what we reviewed earlier. So, uh, forty six percent grew uh, Candida albicans, followed by thirty six percent growing Candida paracelsus. Um, and the um, most common treatment uh, was fluconazole, followed by itraconazole. Um, two patients had uh, peritonitis in the setting of uterine prolapse with pessary use, um, and one had uh, more than one. One of those patients had more than one episode. Um, and so they kind of brought that up as um, whether the use of the pessary might have been an additional risk factor for those patients. Um, and then notably uh, in this study, uh, they didn't see any seasonal variation to their um, infection rates. Um, and then uh, non candidal species were, weren't found. Um, uh, as has been reported in some other countries um, and uh, climates. Um, so they brought up kind of question whether how much climate um, may play a role in the um, type of fungi that are isolated in these episodes, as well as uh, seasonal variability to infection patterns. Um, out in terms of looking at the outcomes of the patient cohort. So 30% of patients ultimately um, underwent catheter removal, which if you're keeping track, represents 80, 83% um, of the patients uh, reviewed. Um, and median delay of about three days from presentation to catheter removal. Um, of the six patients who did not have their catheter removed, um, three were unsuitable for surgery and two received palliative treatment. The other three actually survived their, um, their fungal peritonitis episode and were kept on peritoneal dialysis. Um, in two of the cases, the patients only had very mild symptoms um, and um, this led to uh, the feeling that perhaps they could be managed with catheter preservation. Um, and then the third patient stayed on uh, PD because of lack of any vascular access to transition to um, hemodialysis. So although it's not generally suggested, um, they did have some success in treating um, a select number of these patients without catheter removal. Um, and then in terms of looking at um, transfer to other modalities, um, 17 patients, which was a, almost half, um, transferred to hemodialysis and nine eventually came back to peritoneal dialysis. Um, among those who resumed peritoneal dialysis, the median kind of um, time in between the diagnosis of peritonitis and catheter reinsertion was about 15 weeks. Um, which kind of highlights the need for, um, for a team who is supportive of reevaluating that ability over time. Um, and then among the patients with, uh, with death related to their fungal peritonitis, six still had um, active peritonitis at the time of death. And one patient had sudden death while still in the hospital um, less than four weeks after uh, fungal peritonitis presentation. Um, this is a table that they um, compared the survivors to the non-survivors, and I highlighted the kind of um, relevant, statistically significant um, factors that they um, identified. So in those who were um, who uh, died in the study, um, they were found to have a higher burden of comorbidity, so higher prevalence of diabetes, coronary disease, peripheral arterial disease. 
um, than those who, uh, who did not. Um, and then the time to catheter removal notably was not um, statistically different between the two groups. Um, so that did not seem to have an impact from their evaluation on, um, on mortality. Um, in addition to the comorbidity burden, um, PD vintage tended to be longer among patients who, um, who did not or who died non-survivors. Um, so five years compared to two and a half years. Um, and I think those are the main things I wanted to point out from this chart. Um, and then this chart is um, factors, showing factors associated with death. Um, they utilized a, an exploratory logistic re regression um, and comorbidity burden was expressed um, in the uh, Charleston index, uh, as we talked about before. Um, so they showed that uh, peritoneal effluent white count at presentation greater than 3000 um, was associated with higher risk of uh, peritonitis related death as was PD Ventage, um, but those two uh, factors didn't reach statistical significance. And then although not significant presence of uh, residual urine output seemed to be somewhat protective, um, but although, uh, or because of the small numbers overall of, of cases studied, um, a multivariable analysis couldn't be performed. Um, so in terms of, um, of risk factors, um, they did look at um, fungal prophylaxis um, and notably uh, the, uh, the practice of prescribing um, prophylactic nystatin um, at the time of um, antibiotic administration for patients had been in place in this, um, or in this uh, medical practice since 2005. Um, but uh, despite that, they still did encounter a number of um, patients who, and whom they couldn't find an active um, prescription uh, at the time of um, antibiotic use and then fungal peritonitis. Um, so only four patients out of the 17 who received um, antibiotics, so 24% um, during the overall study period had um, uh, had prescriptions for uh, fungal prophylaxis, and that was from 2000 to 2013, and then four out of eight since 2005, um, so 50% of those. Um, so kind of looking at all of this um, data and information um, overall, some, some of the important fat things I think uh, the study Provides So at the time, um, uh, there were kind of few studies looking at fungal peritonitis cases in North America. There's an older study from 1996 um, that, um, so this was kind of an update from, from that study. So um, as we kind of mentioned in looking at what patterns of fungi we, um, they isolated, um, that's relevant uh, in terms of thinking about different areas of the world um, where we may see variation in, um, in uh, fungal ident fungus identified as well as kind of seasonal variation. Um, they did show uh, that increased comorbid burden was correlated with increased risk of mortality, which is, um, I think, unsurprising. Um, and that a significant proportion of patients uh, were able to return to PD as their treatment modality. Um, and that, that could happen up to six months out from the, um, or did happen up to six months out from their episode uh, of fungal peritonitis in some cases. So that kind of highlighted the importance of really um, making sure that these patients have good follow-up and support to reevaluate whether they may be candidates to return to um, peritoneal dialysis in the future. Um, and then the, I, I think that interestingly, they did report several cases of patients who were able to be treated despite catheter removal, which again is still the recommended um, 
kind of first first line treatment recommendation from the ISPD. Um, and it sounds like the, those patients um, presented with less severe symptoms, um, but were able to maintain uh, use of their peritoneal dialysis catheter. Uh, limitations of the study, just as all studies, I think looking at this topic um, are the, <laughs> the infrequency of fungal peritonitis. So um, representing a much smaller proportion of um, peritonitis episodes in our patients with, who are on peritoneal dialysis overall. Um, and then maybe uh, the, again, comparing to um, patients who had bacterial peritonitis, um, that's kind of something that has uh, been looked at in some of the studies that I mentioned um, in our introduction. Um, so kind of in summary, I think uh, for, again, for the other fellows who may, may not be as seasoned in treating, diagnosing, managing fungal peritonitis, um, it is an infrequent cause of peritonitis, um, but is important to, um, to know about, to recognize, to treat um, due to the increased risk of treatment failure, uh, complications, and loss of um, uh, or technique failure, as well as mortality. Um, and then some of the most uh, well-demonstrated risk factors include um, episodes of peritonitis and antibiotic use. Um, the most common uh, isolated fungi are the candidus, are in the candida species. Um, and then the, the kind of mainstay of treatment is catheter removal um, early. Um, prophylaxis is recommended for any prolonged antibiotic administration, so for more than one dose. Um, and the more, there's more increased mortality um, associated with increased comorbid burden, reduced reg residual renal function, bowel obstruction, and catheter retention. So um, with that, I'm going to um, open it up for any questions, comments, um, further information. Uh, Marin, this is Tom Golper. Uh, a, a, a question on table four, and it's if Fanny Claire wants to, if she can remember enough to comment, is uh, a table four refers to the uh, factors associated with death. And under the uh, albicans, is that related to all other organisms or because it, they, it, they didn't have enough to do a, uh, a more complex analysis. So is that, is the reference point versus all other organisms? I am not sure, I don't know. I would, I would presume so, but. Um... Oh, it, Annie, Claire, do you remember? Do you remember? So I think it was albicans uh, compared to non-albicans, but this is yeah. just univariate, right? So it's very, it's, to be taken with a grain of salt, I would say. Yeah, well, but yeah, it's comparing albicans versus non-albicans. That's right, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. It didn't make sense. It to me didn't have a, a large number. So, uh, and so my uh, the context of that question is uh, when I reviewed uh, the literature on fungal peritonitis, I think uh, at least my interpretation of the very nastiest organism was in fact peropsilosis that if one looked at candida peropsilosis, the outcomes, whether that's technique failure, uh, mortality, whatever, was absolutely the highest of any, any uh, organism. Any comment from any of the other people with experience in this? Yeah, I've got a comment um, because as you know, Tom, we talked about my recent patient who also had HIV, who uh, has now transitioned to um, to HD and is still alive, that really would be the first point I would make. But um, he had candida parasolopsis and um, and transitioned to uh, HD. And then I put in a PD catheter again, and he got candida parasolopsis again. And I've been reading a literature on that, and that's what I have, have found as well. Um, I do have a question about table four, for um for Dr. Nadeau for debt also, if that's okay, if I can piggyback on your request, Tom, on your question. Um, 
And um, uh, realizing that there's often a back and forth with um, the statisticians that you work with, I have a statistical question because I'm in the midst currently of a back and forth with two of my statistical colleagues who are sort of figuring out. I'm just, I was, so first of all, even though this sample size is small, the fact that you have this table four is a total setup for a larger sample size with multivariate regression in the future, right? I mean, this, I, this is why you do this is so that in the future you can say, well, we've identified these factors and now we have 300 patients, which, you know, will have to be multi-center, but I see this as extremely useful even though it's not multivariate. But my question is, you use the Charlson comorbidity index, not the Davies. And I don't, I'm just curious to know if that was something that you talked about or was your use to the Charlson, so you went with that, but, um, or your statisticians preferred it, or have you found that it, that the Charlson is sort of a more accurate, a less wrong model, if you will. You know, all models are wrong, some are useful. I think it's because we were used to use the Charleston. You're used to the Charleston. So it wasn't a specific, yes. we're using Charleston instead of Davies because. It was just, this is what you are accustomed to and you, you it's a tool. You yes, use. and we had the data to do it, but I, I would be very, very cautious with any data in that table because the numbers are so small. But for the CCIA, it was just that we used to uh, take the Charleston comorbidity index for different project and... I see them both used, and I was just curious. So thank you very much. That's helpful. Um, I have a question, Marin. Um, did you see anything about amphotericin versus diflucan? Um, diflucan, as you know, is a static, not cytal drug. Um, and, you know, somewhere along the line, we've been emphasizing using diflucan more and more. And I wonder if some of the um, bad outcomes we're seeing could be related to the fact that we are using a static drug. So do you see any data comparing those? Um, I, I didn't look um, at that specifically. So I, I can't say that I saw data about that. I would say that um, looking at, you know, the the table from the ISPD guidelines here um, and the potential treatment options that's not listed, um, but um, I didn't see I didn't see any data specifically comparing those two. Yeah, you know that brings up two issues for me, Julie, and I I would be very interested to know. Marin, Marin, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Rachel. Sure. Fucatazole is diflucan. Right. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So it is actually the first recommendation. Or, yeah. I, I'm and, and I, I think this is like that. very typical of our ID. Like if you ask one of the ID people, they're going to tell you to use Diflucan if it's sensitive to it. But I don't know, Tom or someone else on the phone yeah. call. I mean, I, I, I think Amphoterable, and I know it's really Amphotericin, but I used to call it Amphoterable. I mean, I was always very impressed um, with its societal effect and, and with its efficacy, even though it, would, it had a lot of tolerance issues. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm, um, yes. Uh, so I don't, um, I didn't see anything mentioning, sorry, fluconazole, yes, versus um, amphotericin. Um, but, um, in particular, like several species that they recommended amphotericin, of course, as a first line, you know, medic, uh, drug to use. But well, in, in patients with like candida, um, that's generally susceptible. Fluconazole was was kind of what I saw very consistently recommended as first line therapy. Well, so fluconazole is what I treated this guy with the first time he had fungal peritonitis and survived. And so the second go round, I talked to the ID docs, knowing that table in the ISPD paper, and I was talking about oral uh, voriconazole or even IP uh, voriconazole. And there, there was, that was not, um, there was a lot of um, not wanting to do that from the part of the ID docs, partly because my particular patient has HIV and so there's concern for drug-drug interactions. But I share your concern, Julie, about um, fluconazole not being as effective. I also have a concern about doing IP versus oral. I just, I, I it's not clear to me that we're getting good 
um, IP uh, bioavailability so that it's truly, um, you know, static and perhaps sidle. I would have to look up for a conosol. But um, it, it um, the other the other reason why I think this paper is important and why I think your question is important, Julie, is the potential rise of resistant organisms, right? So we're seeing more fungal organisms that are resistant to what we've been doing for the past 30 years. And, and so I don't have good answers for this. I think the thing that kept this guy alive was taking the catheter out right away. Uh, well, pretty soon. <laughs> um, but I... I don't have clear answers on this. I think your question about choice of therapy is very useful, Julie. I also would add um, the route of administration as something to think about. And if I do take this guy and try him on PD again, I won't do it without an active surveillance program and also perhaps consideration for a medication um, uh, other than fluconazole, maybe even some prophylactic Voriconazole after probably much discussion and consideration. <laughs> so I am curious to know what what folks think about that. Prophylactic as in like uh, you mean once you resume PD? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just the, for me this is uncharted territory. Um, so I I I think this is a really useful paper. I'm I'm interested to read it. I'm interested for the discussion. Um, I'm lucky that I don't have a resistant fungal infection right now. I mean, I know what fungus it is. It's Paracelopsis and a guy with HIV. So I don't want to be too fixated on my particular patient, but you know, this is a very relevant paper, even though the sample size is small. So I don't, in my experience, I've, I've resumed PD for patient with fungal peritonitis and I've never used a uh, prophylaxis uh, fluconazole afterward. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. But as a staff, I haven't had that many cases. And I, when we did that review, that was 10 years ago. So I may, I have forgot a few things, but I don't recall we've used um, ongoing, well, prophylaxis for fluconazole with the exception of the patient that were kept on PD. And I think this patient, one of them may have had uh, fluconazole for a very long time, but I, I can't remember the details. Yeah. But the, we always so, gave yeah. fluconazole uh, per, like uh, orally. So when I, I never use a IP fluconazole. Right. That was right. for your previous comment. Oh. Well, and so let, let, let me just say another thing is when I talked to Tom about this, I said, I know I can't use Ampho B because it hurts too much. That's contraindicated. And uh, so Tom, I hope that my memory of our conversation is correct. You said, well, that's because it's such a big dose. So if you right. don't use the loading dose, if you just use the maintenance dose, you actually can do Ampho B IP, which was in my mind as a hard like land, line in the sand that you never crossed. So that so there's a lot actually, of- Actually, I've used it a lot. And you have, IP? My gut feel, like in the old days, I think thanks to Tom's nice Stanton protocol that he implemented, we rarely see this and I'm grateful for that. Um, but sometimes there's that old saying, you know, no pain, no gain. <laughs> so, so, Tom, so I have, have, let, let, me, let me comment <laughs> on pain and amphotericin and pain in general. Part of the reason you take these catheters out is because when this infection of virtually any kind gets rolling, it's so painful, patients will say, I'll never be on PD again because of the pain. So there's an argument there to get the catheters out. Uh, with regards to the amphotericin, uh, uh, you might have sensitivity uh, to a, a dose as low as half a, half a milligram per liter. And so the, the doses that were recommended to treat were much higher than that. So, uh, but if you wanted to use IP as well as uh, uh, IV, uh, you, that is the drug that's got the, that's got the greatest clout is still amphotericin. Uh, and so that is what uh, some of you were referring to of using an IP dose that's much, much less than if, if it were the only route of administration. Thank you. That's useful to know. That's very helpful. There's also literature about amphotericin BIP causing adhesion formation, uh, right? Aside from just like the patients like having burning and pain. I mean, I don't know. I uh, all I, that though, but but uh, Osamba, all that is using doses. I think it's four milligrams per liter. 
or maybe it's two milligrams per liter. So, uh, it, it, you know, the, the pain is telling you something. The pain is telling you it's irritating and the consequence of irritation is, is scarring. So that I, I buy what you're saying, but I still wonder whether if you have no options and these patients are going to stay on PD because you have no access, as Annie Claire described some of the patients, if you have no options, I, I would end up using amphotericin and I would do it both intravenously and IP. And the IP would be at, at uh, doses in that uh, half a milligram per liter. So this is a, this is a shot in the dark because I know this hasn't really been formally studied, but uh, just thinking about it, I would say if there's a patient who developed um, uh, PD peritonitis, uh, it's fungal, and you're going to keep the catheter. Right, when, because the patient is not a surgical candidate, then um, you can continue with the oral regimen and do the trial of low dose of fungal um, uh, treatment IP as well. Uh, where where I kind of question the utility of that is if I removed the catheter, waited a few months, and then reinserted the catheter to restart the same patient back on PD. What is the utility of putting uh, fungal prophylaxis IP at that point? You know, I don't think that adds much. And that's kind of going back to uh, Rachel's patient, right? Because remember, Rachel, I, I was also involved with that. With right, those, yeah, yeah. IP attendings and so, and, oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, you know, <laughs> the, the utility of that at that point, I understand. But I think for, let's say, you know, in um, the Dr. Nadeau for that uh, um, study, right, those three patients who continued um, on PD after that, those those perhaps low-dose uh, fungal IP uh, treatment uh, along with the oral regimen, right, of, of fluconazole, um, you know, would be, you know, a, a plausible. Uh, you know, the other side of that, though, um, Osama, is, you know, I've seen several patients, you know, this is back when we saw a lot of this. Um, we got their catheters out. We did everything. But they ended up with fungal um, infiltration of their liver or, you know, hiding fungus pockets within the peritoneum. And, and those patients worried me that maybe we pulled too soon and didn't give a few days for it to sort of, you know, float around in the same places, all the same corners that the fungus was. I know that sounds like. No, know, that's boo -boo. exactly right. That, so that's truly, that's exactly right. And Rose, Osam, I'm remembering this now. I apologize. I'd forgotten. You were taking care of this patient when I admitted them or went off service or something. And that was exactly my point, Julie, to the ID doc that we were talking about. It was like, you know, this IV medication may not be really treating the fungus that's in his belly. And if we could just leave the catheter in for, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, and directly administer an anti antifungal, there's a, you know, that may be a good choice. He wasn't that, that sick. Um, but there was just, there was a great deal of resistance. Uh, well, Osama, you can speak to this as well. They just wanted the catheter out and they didn't want to really talk about it. But I completely agree with you, Julie. And the fact that he got again with the exact same bug makes me concerned that it's because we didn't do that the first time. So I think that's a very, um, I absolutely think that's a valid point. Um, yeah, and honestly, like, and thanks to days like today where Marin does such a great job reviewing for us the literature and, you know, unfortunately it's a literature in an orphan population, if you will, in terms of small numbers, but um, that's what we have to live with. I, I actually don't consider the ID consultants helpful. Um, I feel like I know the peritonitis literature with fungus better than they do. I know, again, I want to be rude, but like, no, I wanted this to go it, to, like, yeah. you can just see how different these people are. Only 30% yeah. get a fever. Um, they don't look that sick. I mean, it's a very different process, which has very different consequences. Um, yeah. But, the ER put him on an ID team. So then I, I had to respectfully, we respectfully had conversations with our ID attending. I wanted him to be on a medicine team where I could call the shots, but it is what it is. But yeah, I agree with you. 
So just real quick, let's shift gears because I know uh, Dr. Rodby, you shared with us um, a link for a paper in the in the chat. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Well, all I have is the abstract. I was looking it up quickly, but it, it actually supports what you guys were just saying about the uh, not always getting adequate interperitoneal levels with inter with adequate interperitoneal. The levels in the blood do not correlate with the which is a little exactly. a little exactly. Yes, that's exact. Thank you, Dr. Rodby. I'm writing this reference down. That's exactly <laughs> right. So I don't know. I'm a little surprised, but uh, I guess it's important. Yeah, let's see, Marin, if can, can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, that supports exactly thing? what Julie was saying. I completely agree. Okay, 21 patients. Okay, all right. So I just want—I was just curious what the sample size is. Uh, is can here. you and scroll it, up in again? Nine patients with a maximum that. serial level. Yeah. F-tertiary B was in, was undetectable in the peritoneum. I mean, you know, that's not good. Yeah. Hmm. We're just spitting into the wind. It's not doing anything. Use the catheter. You've got a catheter. It's working. Use it. Um, so I've never used IP uh, FO, unlike Julie, and and I'm as old as her. But I always always just thought it was you know it hurt and fibros like the two well, things that were brought up. So, but I have no experience. I, I, oh, here we go. I've used it. I've used it, and uh, I agree with you guys. And uh, yes, you can see from the, the abstract that Roger sent, the 0.5, uh, th that can hurt too. But guys, it can't hurt to try it. Well, like it can hurt to try it. You know what I mean? It won't hurt me to try it. It'll hurt the patient to try it. But but I would try the 0.5. Okay. So, yeah. so two things come to mind, right, with this. If we are to keep to keep it and let the, the catheter, that is, um, and do some... IP treatment, right, prior to catheter removal, because I think there is agreement that in cases where the patient is a surgical candidate and you can remove the catheter, how much time is enough time, right? Um, like in, uh, in Dr. Nadeau for um, uh, uh, analysis, um, that table that Marin showed that had, you know, the survivors and non-survivors, I think it was three days, three and a half days, uh, right, that the catheter stayed in. I know, Rachel, your patient, it was within 24 hours that the PD catheter was removed. So I think determining, you know, how much time is enough time? And if you did remove the catheter, uh, the other thing to think about is how long is enough before you reinsert the PD catheter? Like how long on average do you all tend to wait before reinserting it? What would be your minimum? Just something practical too for the fellows uh, to think about, right? So if they're out in practice and they had a fungal peritonitis patient and you know they did get their PD catheter removed, how long do they keep them on um, HD if they needed to switch modalities? Yeah, I, I think, um, Again, also, I'm watching this happen over decades. I think you have to keep in mind that the fashion is to do one thing or another right now, and that fashion is not based on well-designed, well-powered clinical trials. It's just the fa the fashion. So guidelines don't, if they're not unpacked by evidence, don't really mean anything. Um, including this, for sure, you have to take it out. I I'm not sure we have. I mean, I, I get it, but I'm not totally sure that if we actually studied it, we in a randomized way that we'd find that out. But, but I think we lost you, Julie. I don't know if you, but yeah, I usually do months. Yeah, I'm planning on at least four months, maybe six. Four months before another catheter? I think so. Yeah. Oh. This is the second one with, I know, I know. And he hates, well, so he does have residual renal function. So we're doing uh, Tom Golfer's incremental dialysis. He's just at the hairy edge where he gets hyperkalemic and bicar, you know, and, and acidotic, and we can't quite handle him with oral meds, but he's not doing three days a week right now. He's doing once one day a week and we'll probably bump him up to two. Um, but he, it'll be up to the attending at the HD unit, but yeah, I'm good. But that's partly because I'm going to, uh, have a conversation with his HIV doctor about, 
um, which antifungal, we have to be ready this time. We have to think about drug drug interactions with his HIV meds. His HIV is undetectable, but still there's synergy. You know, there's one article of HIV with parasolopsis and it's just particularly bad. So we have to think about what we're going to treat him with, how we're going to treat him. And I, um, if we go back to PD, this will be his third third time and also a plan for surveillance um, uh, cell counts and cultures. I, I need to be checking those at least once a month, maybe twice a month. Dr. Fussell, that um, that patient you're referring to is the one who kind of made me interested in looking at this topic a little bit more. Um, but I, I was just going to circle back to the question on, of how many weeks or how long it was in the study and the median time to catheter reinsertion was um, 15 weeks. So they have a range, had a range of eight to 23. So a bit, um, I well, maybe in the realm of what, what similar to what you all are, are kind of mentioning from what I'm hearing. Yeah, I don't know why it has to be that long. I mean, it's not like if you still had infection in there, you're not going to make it that long. Um, I would say minimum six weeks, just like uh, bacterial peritonitis. And then I guess it depends on the, if it's the first episode, if the patient has a lot of risk factors, but I wouldn't wait too long. So I would be okay to put back a catheter after two months for well, what, so what I did before. So thank you. That is useful. I'm interested uh, in that. Um, and perhaps I won't wait six months based on this conversation with colleagues. Um, uh, my next question is, would you do, uh, you know, like a tagged white blood cell scan or something to try and find a pocket of infection um, before even putting that PD catheter back in? I mean, what if he does have a pocket? He's had other He's had other studies. I have to go back and see. There was none seen at the time that we, I'm pretty sure he had a CT during that hospitalization. They didn't see a path, pocket of infection, but they could go back and look more closely. You know, is there some kind of diagnostic imaging we could do? I guess this case is different because it's a like the, he had a repeat fungal peritonitis. So it's yes. not like you would go back. Um, I would I always wait at least two weeks after treatment of and so uh, yeah so two weeks after the treatment ends and then maybe a scan could be done but I think because fungal takes time sometimes to show up and that's why often patients are not very sick when they present it's a low white blood cells and and then so on maybe this patient has risk factors of his own and it's gonna repeat but I don't feel any real benefits of waiting longer if without any treatment what so if the patient is not treated uh -huh. Um, I don't think more time will make a difference. If he has to repeat, it's going to repeat. But it's not based on evidence, right? It's just, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But still, uh, thank you for your thoughts on that. That's helpful. Thank you. So uh, just to respect everyone's time, we're two minutes past the hour. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Marin for a great uh, presentation. Great job, Marin. Very thorough. Um, I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank Dr. Nadeau for that, for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure. And hopefully you can join us in our uh, future home dialysis journal clubs. We do this once a month, every month. Um, and we can add you to, to the mailing list so you can get the notifications as well. It'd be an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Rodby, Dr. Golper. Um, and we will see you all uh, next month. And Julie, and Julie. And Julie, thank of you, course, Julie. yeah. Yep. Dr. Lewis, yeah. And we'll see you all in uh, next month's home dialysis journal club. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.